before most people get a tattoo, they brainstorm it, pin inspiring art to their vision board. They philosophize about the deep personal meaning of their masterpiece, or at least choose a legit tattoo artist. Not me. I'm 19, wandering down Main Street with my druggy boyfriend, Mike. Really high. I'm on methamphetamine. <laughs> because that's my life as a teenage addict. Seeing a tattoo shop, it hits me. Hey, time for me to declare my adulthood with permanent ink on my skin. Inside is a hairy biker dude who's old, like 30. <laughs> Despite my heroin chic look, I look like I still need my parents to drive me home from book club. I confidently say, a tattoo. I don't know which one. You can almost hear him mutter, damn kids, as he points to the art books. Flipping through, we search for the cookie cutter tattoo that fits me best. What I love about Mike is the excitement. I never know what we'll get into. We met when I was 16. He's the resident drug dealer at my favorite coffee shop. He introduced me to hard drugs, Thanks to meth, I can party with him while still finding time to study all night for honors classes, and work, and volunteer. Looking at the cheesy designs, I grow impatient and point at number 88. It made me slightly giggle, and therefore belongs on my body forever. <laughs> Mike agrees, it's cute. A floppy-eared bunny, falling asleep, no, stoned, with a blunt hanging out of its furry carrot-chomping mouth, under a tree with a pot leaf. It's a pot tree? <laughs> it's obviously perfect. Tattoo guy takes one look and says, no. No? Well, well, that's hella whack, which is how we talk. He gives me a speech like he's my dad, except it's his biker brother, Uncle Jax. You'll have this tattoo all your life, and you'll regret it when you stop smoking weed and have grandkids. The hell I will? First, I tell him I'm never having kids. But he says, you'll change your mind. This dude thinks he knows me better than I know myself. <laughs> and second, I insist, I'm a pothead for life, yo. This is club soda. <laughs> I argue, but he is totally bugging. Fine. I spend 60 seconds looking. Might as well have closed my eyes and pointed. Yep, number 94. I ask, is this one acceptable to you, sir? Rolling his eyes, he asks, where do I want it? Nowhere visible. It's an out-of-the-way spot that unfortunately would soon give rise to a derogatory nickname. But is it really a tramp stamp if it's right justified, not centered? <laughs> no, it isn't. As Uncle Jax presses the transfer paper on my back, he asks if I've ever had prolonged pain. I tell him I tried to pierce my belly button using ice and a safety pin. 
at a sleepover when I was 15. But I only got halfway, which my best friend never let me live down. Oh, I see. I have overshared once again. And that story does not earn me street cred. Okay, some things never change. <laughs> I sit on the table sideways in my Daisy Dukes with combat boots to show how tough I am. When Uncle Jack starts, it feels stabby. But I'm okay. Partway through the outline, he disinfects my back and restarts needling. Suddenly searing pain. I look back expecting to see him holding a lighter to me. I'm hit with a wall of dark energy. Like when you accidentally take too many drugs because you're sure they're bunk and you're about to demand your money back, but then out of nowhere, a rubber hose turns into a king snake and you befriend a frowny face talking apple in its belly and start to hyperventilate because now it's too much. <laughs> the world goes black. When I open my eyes, Mike and Uncle Jax are lifting me onto the table. In mid-sentence, I had passed out, fallen backward, and would have cracked my skull on the concrete if Mike hadn't caught me. When they sit me up, I realize I have to throw up, and I stumble to the bathroom. As I drop to my bare knees on the unspeakably dirty floor of the Main Street tattoo shop, I can't help but wonder, why am I doing this? In hindsight, I always had something to prove. I was a too skinny, depressed teenager who felt I had to perform and be perfect, even if it means following through with this drug-fueled decision, no matter how dumb it sounds. It's about refusing to admit defeat. So I get back on that table. To distract me, Mike talks nonstop as tweakers do. <laughs> Uncle Jax pauses and my back burns. I pass out again and throw up again. Now I've attracted negative attention, my nightmare from the tattoo artists, the front desk girl and their clients who all agree it's my pain tolerance. I don't think it hurts that much, but apparently my body can't handle it, so I'm passing out. And my body can't handle that, so I'm vomiting. Behind my back, they're laughing at me. Or am I paranoid? No, no, they are, they're laughing. Is it the tweak, I whispered to Mike? He doesn't think so. But am I on drugs that heighten sensitivity when I should be on something that dulls my senses? Yes and yes. Just like the tattoo itself, I hadn't given thought to why people get drunk, not spun out, before they get one. So reluctantly, I continue. But soon I pass out again and throw up again. My bare knees, now dirtier than if I really were some tramp at a busy truck stop. <laughs> this is it. Halt, cease, desist. I grab Mike and tell him, we're leaving. That's when he checks out my back and says, you only have half of the outline. I don't care. I'm Audi 5000. For the first and possibly only time in my life, Mike gives me sage advice. It's just a weird line you'll have forever. Even if you don't color it in, you have to finish the outline. Mike, like a lot of addicts, is very convincing. He once convinced me to go into the lion's den, the police station, while high, as he turned in a stolen stick of dynamite, what? which I know nothing about. <laughs> dynamite that was sweating in the heat. This was after I convinced him he could no longer store it under his bed. 
without air conditioning in the desert. <laughs> so it works both ways. I say, I'll return later for the outline because I, like a lot of addicts, am a liar who will say anything to get out of this. Mike is on to me. He says, suck it up, buttercup, which is how he talks when he's high. And just like that, they pull me back in. The three of us agree we'll power through without stopping. And without further incident, the outline is done. They assure me the color will be easier, so I keep going. I've conquered this. Finally, the tattoo is finished. I'm eager to go celebrate by snorting a fat rail. <laughs> Uncle Jack slathers on one last coat of an antiseptic called green soap. And for the fourth time, I pass out again and throw up again. That was how I found out it wasn't the pain. It was the soap. Turns out I have severe skin allergies to everything. Ever since I started doing meth, I'd get rashes and sometimes pass out. I believe the drug changed my chemistry and caused these reactions that got worse with repeated exposure. I'm lucky to have quit for good. So long ago that I've forgotten my dealer's pager number. <laughs> but the allergies still plague me to this day, as does the tattoo. I haven't seen it in years since I stopped wearing crop tops. It's always covered. It's a devil, a cartoon devil, meant to poke fun at things people fear. It's unrecognizable, just a faded blob. But one friend said it looks like it's wearing a diaper. <laughs> Months later, someone on the street yelled, girl, with the tattoo. I thought because my tat is rad. <laughs> no. <laughs> she worked at that shop where I'm apparently famous. She told her friend, this is the girl who came in. <laughs> Anytime I'm near a tattoo shop, I get dizzy and nauseous, which means I can never edit my tattoo or turn it into something else. It's a permanent reminder of who I was then and how far I've come in escaping a way of life that later sent Mike to prison. In the end, Uncle Jax was right. I would have regretted even more a floppy-eared, blunt-smoking bunny tattoo on my back, which is definitely not a tramp stamp. <laughs> Thank you. That is Vamp veteran Jake Carroll, everyone.